Hello everyone and welcome to the Step Closer audiobook. Um, a few things to say really before we begin. Uh, this is my first time reading this, so you're going to get my reaction with this. Um, and the book literally came out today, so I haven't seen any spoilers or anything. Um, and I'm just going to straight up read it. I think I'm going to read it all in one session. <laughs> uh, and then edit all the videos later. Uh, but this is Step Closer. Um, it looks like we have three stories again. Uh, we have Step Closer, Dance With Me, and Coming Home. Uh, and I'll do three separate, um, like, big audiobooks for this. Uh, but we're going to get straight in to Step Closer. I'm so excited. As I said, uh, you're going to hear my reaction to this. So um, <laughs> that should be enjoyable too. But let's just get straight into this. <clears throat> Foxy's yellow eyes glowed in the darkness of the room. His jaw hung open, flashing sharp teeth. Foxy lifted his hook and slashed its sh sharp tip in front of Pete's face, the hook whizzing by his nose. Pete rolled off the bed, his body shaking, his stomach pitched as he lay helpless on the floor, and Foxy pivoted, looming over, uh, looming over him. The shifting of gears filled the room as Foxy swung up with his hook. You can be a pirate, but first you'll have to lose an eye and an arm. No, Pete breathed. When Foxy slammed his hook down into Pete's eye, an audible pop sounded. Blood poured from his eye socket as Pete screamed. <laughs> what the hell? This... This... Uh... Okay. <laughs> uh, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza was crowded with crazy little kids and their harassed idiot parents. Harsh. Uh, music bellowed through wall speakers and arcade games pinged and vibrated. The scent of burnt pepperoni wafted through the air, mixed with the scent of cotton candy. Pete was slouched against a wall, ankles crossed, and ball caps turned backwards, drinking a cherry flavoured cola while chewing watermelon gum. His little brother and his friends were crowded around an arcade game. Pete didn't want to be there, but his mother had to work, and Chuck had to be with his friends after school again. So that left Pete to play babysitter. For the hundredth time, he asked himself, why was it always his job? And was the little snot grateful? Nope. Chuck was always whining about his inhaler, always whining he was hungry, always asking a bunch of questions, always something. Since their dad had left, Pete was saddled with everything Chuck. His mum's words were stuck in his head. You're the man of the house now, Pete. Take care of your little brother. How was Pete supposed to be the man when he was just 16? Did anyone ask him what he thought of his new responsibilities? Double note. Pete watched a little kid walk up to a couple of employees cleaning up birthday tables. He pulled on a guy's sleeve. The man looked down at the kid and smiled. Can I help you with something? He asked. I was wondering, where is Foxy the pirate? The kid said. The man's voice was syrupy, syrup, syrupy sweet. Oh, Foxy's on vacation at the moment. We hope to have him back soon. The little kid stuck his lip out, but nodded as he walked away. The other employee chuckled. Good one, he told the man. Yeah, on vacation in the maintenance room. Don't know when they'll bring the show out again. Pete was thinking that over when he realised someone was saying his name. Pete? He pulled his attention from the conversation and moved his gaze toward Maria Rodriguez. Rod I, sorry, I cannot say that last name. <laughs> who was standing beside him. Her black hair brushed her shoulders and her lips were glossy red. She had these bright green eyes with long lashes and a few freckles on her nose. She was a cheerleader at their high school and he'd known her since sixth grade. So why did he suddenly feel so nervous around her? Hey, Maria, he said. Stuck here with little Chucky, huh? Pete scowled. scowled. Yeah, same here, my little sister's birthday. Maria motioned to a birthday table in front of the stage with little kids wearing cone hats and eating cake. Can't believe we used to be like them. He smirked. Don't know about you, but I was never like that. Maria smiled. Sure, so where you been? Haven't seen you at practice lately. He'd been benched from football for unnecessarily for unnecessary roughness and having a bad attitude on multiple occasions. Hello, this was football. So, he just quit altogether. 
The truth was, Pete never used to quit anything. He used to finish whatever he started. But after seeing his parents quit each other, finishing things didn't matter so much anymore. Oh. Plus, he didn't need any more grief from the coach. He got enough from that of his teachers and his mum. A kid could only handle so much griping. He, he shrugged. Got tired of it all, you know. Yeah, I guess. So what are we going to do with your free time now? Well, someone waved to Maria from the party table and her face lit up. Yes, finally time to leave. Before she left, she added, Hey, a bunch of us are meeting under Old Beacon Bridge if you want to hang out there later. Pete smiled. Yeah? She nodded. It'll be fun. Then he shook his head. Can't. I have to watch Chuck the Chump. Oh, okay. Maybe next time. See you around school. Irritation washed over Pete as he watched Maria walk away. This is all Chuck's fault, little brat. Everything was always about his little brother. Didn't matter what Pete wanted because nothing mattered when it came to Pete. Dad had left. Mum was in her own little world. They'd figured they'd just put Pete in charge of Chuck because they didn't have the time to deal with him themselves. But Pete had never signed up to take over their responsibilities. He was a kid and kids should be free, not worrying about stuff. They should be able to do what they wanted, like hanging out with other kids instead of watching Little Brothers. But his parents didn't care about any of that, obviously. After all, they never asked Pete if he had wanted them to split up in the first place. They just divorced and that was that. None of it was fair. Pete had so many emotions inside of him that sometimes he just didn't know what to do with them. Sometimes he felt like a ticking bomb about to explode, like the tension in his body was just under his skin, begging for release. For a while, football had helped. He'd been, on a, he'd been a beast on the field, taking down players, throwing people out of the way. By the end of practice, he'd been exhausted and empty. Empty was better. It was good. But since he was off the team, Pete was stuck without an outlet. He hated these feelings. He hated everything, sometimes. He watched his brother break off from his friends to head to the bathroom, and his eyes narrowed on the fresh opportunity. Pete tossed his soda at an empty table and walked quickly to his brother's side, latching onto his arm forcefully. Chuck's face screwed up. Ow, Pete! Shut up and walk, he muttered, then blew a bubble till it popped. Why? Where are we going? You'll see. With a quick look over his shoulder, Pete hustled his little brother to walk down a long and darkened corridor. The floor was faded and old, and peeling posters of animatronics lined the walls. The place needed a serious upgrade. Pete had wandered down here before and discovered the large maintenance room. Now that he knew what was taking a vacation inside, he couldn't wait to take Chuck along for a little adventure, considering his brother had always been scared of a certain animatronic. Chuck started to protest. Where are we going? What's the matter? You scared? No, I just want to stay with my friends. We're going to check something out. Chuck hiccuped and licked his dry lips around his braces. He sounded like a toad when he was nervous. Just leave me alone or I'm telling mum. You're such a little snitch. Now you're really going in. Pete dragged his surprisingly strong little brother through the entrance of the maintenance room to meet Foxy the pirate. Oh, okay. This, this is starting out, starting out good. Starting out good. Um, yeah, I've noticed that this takes place while the pizzerias are open, which is very different to other stories. Let's carry on. The heavy door slammed behind them, engulfing them in darkness. Pete, let me go. Quiet. Someone might hear and I don't want to listen to you whining like a baby. Do you know how annoying that is? Pete wouldn't let loose of the vice grip he had on his brother. No. It was time to teach Chuck a lesson. It was time for Pete to do what he wanted. And right now, that meant giving his brother a good scare. Little Chuck the chump might even pee his pants. Pete chuckled at the idea. With one hand still firmly on his brother's arm, he fished his phone out of his pocket and turned on the light to guide them slowly through the darkness. The area was strangely quiet, as if it wasn't connected to a boatload of people just down a hallway. The smell here was stagnant and musty, and the air seemed lifeless, as if no one had set foot in the place recently, which was weird when the rest of the building was full of activity. Hiccup. Pete. But Pete's foot knocked a bottle across the floor. It hit something and shattered. Pete and Chuck froze, wondering if someone would hear, but no one seemed to be around. 
cup. Pete scanned the floor, floor with uh, the light, revealing scuffed black and white checkered tiles. Dusty tables and a few broken chairs were scattered about the large room. There were cardboard boxes on the tables, half empty with party hats and plates scattered around them. His light flashed on a big black spider sitting on the edge of one box. Oh, look at that spider. It's huge, Pete said. The spider jumped away and the boys leaped back. I hate spiders. Let's get out of here, Chuck whined again. Not yet. There's so much more to explore. Think of it like one of those adventure games you'd like to play. We have to find the secret treasure, Pete said, laughing under his breath. More like he had to scare the crap out of his brother a little more. He flashed the light back down to the floor. He stopped on what looked like dark me melted candles and strange black markings. What is that? Are those symbols? Chuck wanted to know. Who cares? Pete continued to wave the light around. Then he saw the small stage with the closed purple curtain and a grin split his mouth. Pinned to the curtain, there was a crooked sign with the words, Out of Service. Score. Hopefully it works. Hiccup. Pete, we shouldn't be there. We should. We could get in trouble. Like big trouble, like trespassing, you know? That's against the law. That's against the law. Pete mimicked him in a tiny voice. <laughs> You're such a nerd, you know that? What are you gonna do what are you gonna be when you grow up, Chuck? A cop? I'll be sure to buy you a donut on the way home. Pete shined the light next to the stage, revealing a rusted control box on a side table. The cover was broken off the box. This is gonna be so good. He dragged his brother to the foot of the stage. Enjoy the show, little brother. Stop it, Pete! He grabbed Chuck by the shirt and pants, leave giving him a good wedgie as he launched him onto the little stage. Chuck crashed onto the platform with an ugh, and, sorry, with an ugh, oh no, that sounds even worse, with an ugh, and Pete rushed to the control box. He slammed the palm on the button that said start, again and then again. A low hum sounded, followed by a muffled click and clank. Oh, come on, Pete yelled when nothing happened. Finally, the small curtain began to open. <laughs> sorry. I meant to do hiccup, 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 but I can't really fake a hiccup. Uh, <laughs> in a quick motion, Chuck rolled to the side. Chuck, you wimp! Pete rushed to the stage, grabbing Chuck by his sneakers to keep him there. In the quick moves only fear can bring on, Chuck managed to evade his brother. He climbed to his feet, jumped off the platform, and ran. That was the fastest Pete had ever seen his brother run. If he hadn't been running from, pre from Pete, he might even be interested. Pete moved to get him back, then came to halt in front of the stage as his shirt caught on something. Dang, he muttered. He tugged on his shirt, but it was caught on a stupid nail. Choppy music sounded through the air as the curtains opened fully. Pete stood frozen in front of a fractured foxy animatronic that was glaring down at him. The yellow eyes glowed under red brows, and an eye patch flipped up over his right eye. A jaw with sharp, pointy teeth hung loosely as the big fox began to sing a disjointed song about becoming a pirate. Oh no, I can see it there, oh no. <laughs> One arm had a hook for a hand, and the other hand was stripped of fur, showing its robotic skeleton. Strange sounds of whirling gears screeched and seemed to echo in the quiet of the room. The robot's chest appeared ripped open, exposing more of his mechanical body. Foxy moved slowly, eerily. Even though Pete knew he was a robot, his, his deteriorated body looked to be half-eaten any away by who knew what. A shiver skittered down Pete's spine. He swallowed his gum. He couldn't move his gaze away from Foxy's yellow eyes as he sang. Didn't know why. Just a dumb, old robot. Oh no. You can be a pirate, but first you have to lose an eye and an arm. Yar! <laughs> I, feel, I, feel, I feel that was good. I feel like that was good. Uh, and that just repeats like four times. The old animatronic was stuck on the same lyric. First you have to lose an eye and an arm. Yar! Pete blinked at the stage as the stage feeling came over him like an invincible cold. An, an invisible cold, heavy blanket was covering every inch of his body, then sinking through his skin and into his bones. First you have to lose an eye and an arm. Yar! The room grew still with a sudden silence, yet Pete remained standing there in the dark, unmoving. He blinked and looked around. 
trying to remember where he was. He was in the dark, alone. His pulse scrambled as he stepped back. Then he saw his shirt was caught on a nail, and it all came back to him. He rubbed at his eyes, yanked his shirt from the nail, and stormed away from the stage to find his brother. Dang it, Chuck. Pete watched Chuck suck. Oh, that's really hard to say. Pete watched Chuck suck in a puff or of his inhaler before he sat down at the dinner table. He could tell his little brother's nerves were still shot from when he went from when Pick. Oh my gosh, from when Pete took him to see Foxy the pirate. Chuck eyed Pete across the table and squirmed. Pete didn't know what he was so upset about. The little brat didn't even get to see the best part of the show. He'd run away and stuck closely to his friends until it was time to come home. How is Freddy Fazbear's pizza, boys? Their mum asked as she, as she set plates of ham and potatoes in front of them. Fine, Chuck said, without looking up from his plate. Yeah, just dandy, Pete muttered, swallowing mashed potatoes. What? Did something happen? No, nothing, the boy said together. Pete gave Chuck a warning look. Better not tell. Mum raised her eyebrows as she sat down. Okay, well, I have something exciting to share with you both. I thought it was time for us to do something as a family, and something that was good for the world. Pete bit back words that would likely hurt his mum's feelings. What family? It had been nearly six months since Dad had left and broken up their family. And when had she become a good doer, a do-gooder? Something new, something that represents a fresh start from the three of us as a family unit. Something that could give someone else a fresh start to. She pulled out a paper from a folder and turned it towards them. Pete read the bold letters in disbelief. Organ donors? <laughs> Mum nodded in excitement. Yes, we'll be family donors. Doesn't that sound great? Chuck's gaze met Pete's in astonishment. This is your exciting news. You really want us to give up our body parts? Pete asked her. She waved her hand at Pete. Only if something happens to us, silly. Which obviously we don't want, but if it did, we could actually help other people who are sick and in need of a new heart or kidney. We could save someone's life. We'd be heroes. We'd be dead heroes, Chuck said. She laughed. Oh, Chuckles, you make me laugh. Yeah, Chuckles, you're a riot, Pete said, deadpan. Chuck scrunched up his face. Hey, Mum, you know what Pete did at the pizza place? <laughs> Pete narrowed his eyes at Chuck. He knew the little brat couldn't keep his mouth shut. What did he do? He drank way too much soda. Chuck smiled, flashing his railroad tracks. Mum sighed. Pete, come on, I told you what all that soda does to your teeth. Pete just looked back at his mum. What was with her lately? Last month she started to see someone who called herself a life, cho a life coach. Then his mum had started yoga, chopped her long hair off and gone on some weird juice cleanse. She'd also gathered a bunch of her, a bunch of their stuff and given it away to charity. Now, she wanted to donate their body parts. Here, read a flyer, Pete, Mum said. It'll convince you for sure. Pete grabbed the paper his mum shoved under his nose. The list of organ donations were pretty long. Bones, heart, kidney, liver, pancreas, skin, intestine, eyeballs. Eyeballs? You can be a pirate, but first you have to lose an eye and an arm. Yarrow. <laughs> Pete, <fl> <laughs> this is good. Pete flashed back to Foxy. He imagined Foxy suddenly walking off stage and, stalk and stalking toward him with a big, sharp hook, his mechanical feet scraping across the floor. Pete's mashed potatoes did a show roll in his stomach, and he suddenly felt lightheaded. He blinked the image away. What a dumb idea, Mum. Pete, it's not dumb, and it hurts my feelings that you think that. Yeah, Mum was into expressing her feelings lately too. He shoved his chair away from the table and stood up as, fa as his face flashed cold, then hot. I'm not doing it, Mum. Pete, I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to bed. Pete walked out of the dining room. What happened? He heard his mum ask. Chuck sighed. Puberty. <laughs> just, just puberty. <clears throat> I, I think I can see where this story is going. Already. Kind of. Uh, I'm, I'll tell you later if I was right. Um, hurry up, Pete. The next morning, Chuck banged on the bathroom door. If Pete didn't get out soon, Chuck would be late for the bus to WH Jameson Middle School. If he missed the bus, then he'd have to ride his bike five miles, 
five miles to school and his mum would freak out over his going long uh, going freak out over his going alone she was paranoid something would happen if Pete wasn't with him which he didn't understand since he was almost 12 well 11 and a half lots of his friends were left by themselves all the time but not Chuck Pete was Pete always said it because oh my gosh sorry Pete always said it was because Chuck was the baby and their mum couldn't stop thinking him that way. He heard Pete heave into the toilet and Chuck stepped back and cringed. Pete was sick, he figured. Chuck's lip curled a little. That's what he deserves for trying to scare me yesterday. Then he let that thought go as Pete heaved again, stepping back and leaning against the wall to wait. Chuck knew Dad's leaving had changed everyone. Pete was angry all the time. Mum kept searching for new things to make her happy. As for himself, he just tried to keep busy. He liked to hang out with his friends, he liked to play online video games, and he was pretty interested in puzzles. Yeah, middle school sucked, but going to school was just a part of life you had to get through. Every once in a while, he felt challenged by a project. Then he'd complete it and get bored again until something else caught his interest. He got why Pete hated him half the time, because Mum made Pete watch him watch over him so much. He tried not to be annoying, but everything that came out of his mouth seemed to annoy Pete. Maybe it was just like that with all brothers. Chuck didn't know because he didn't have another brother to compare to. The toilet flushed. A minute later, Pete swung open the door. A wave of serious stink wafted at Chuck and he waved a hand in front of his nose. Pete didn't look so good. His face was so pale. His freckles stood out like tiny bugs on his cheeks. His dark hair stuck up in different directions like he jammed his finger in a socket and shocked himself. And there were dark circles under his eyes. Jeez, Pete, what's the matter with you? Nothing, Pete spat out. Something didn't agree with me. Probably something from that stupid Freddy Fazbear's pizza. Chuck didn't think so. Do you want me to call Mum? Pete shoved him aside. No, I'm not a little baby like you, Chuck the Chump. Chuck felt his shoulders stiffen. He hated that stupid nickname. Whatever, he mumbled. He slammed and locked the bathroom door behind him. Ooh, it's it's starting to get into it. I can I can see it rising. Pete chugged an energy drink with chip, triple caffeine while running to his bio class, but he still felt drained and exhausted. He'd had some pretty crazy dreams last night. He couldn't remember much, only that there had been all this blood. It was everywhere, pouring all over him, down his face and over his chest and arms. When he jerked awake, his blankets were tangled around his body. He'd fallen to the floor trying to unwind the blankets just so he could rush to the bathroom to blow chunks. He shivered just thinking about it, but he rolled his shoulders and shoved that not-so-fun memory away. He probably should have stayed home, but calling his mum at work would have freaked her out, and she'd be asking him a million questions. He decided just to get through the day somehow. He looked into his classroom five minutes after the bell. Mr. Dinglewood, you are late, droned, droned Mr. Watson in a bored voice. Note? Pete snatched off his hat and shook his head in a negative. He took an empty stool at the workstation in the far back, next to a kid in a black leather jacket and purple hair. Pete zipped his hat into his pack and set it on the floor then wiped some sweat off his forehead. He shifted awkwardly on the, on the stool. Why couldn't he seem to keep still? As I was saying, class, we will be dissecting a frog today, said Mr. Watson. You have all been quizzed on the safety rules for the tools and procedure. You will work as a team with your partner to fill out the lab sheet. I expect you all to be mature young people. I know that we, that will be hard for some of you, but there is no funny business here or you will fail. You do not want to fail, you have 30 minutes starting now. When they both turned toward the dead frogs sprawled out in front of them, Leather Jacket Guy leaned forward. Dude, what's the matter with you? <laughs> Pete shook his head. Nothing. Leather Jacket Guy came at me, yeah, right, look, and <laughs> picked up a small <laughs> scalpel. Ten minutes in, Pete yawned. His mouth was dry and his hand was starting to shake from the precise cutting. Leather Jacket Guy smirked. Hey, check this out, he said, and poked the frog in its eye with a scalpel. A weird liquid gushed out. Sick, right? Then he shoved the blade into the frog's arm and sliced it off. He picked up the tiny hand and waved it at Pete. Pete shook his head. I need a break. 
just saying, theory. That's a uh, that's a leg and a that's an eye and a leg. Or was it an eye and a leg? An eye and a leg will keep the make you a pirate or something. I don't know. I forgot what it was already. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry. I swear I'll start messing around. He held out the little frog hand. Here, let's shake on it. Oh, sorry, hand. Yeah, hand and arm. Hand and an eye. An eye and an arm. I, I don't remember. <laughs> the kid chuckled as Pete pushed off the stool and headed for the classroom water fountain. He took a couple long drinks. Dang, he was thirsty. And he was starving. His stomach decided to growl then, since he'd skipped breakfast trying to make it to school on time. He was heading back to his worst workstation where Mr. Watson stopped him. Everything's going well, Mr. Dinglewood, he asked. Mr. Watson was shorter than him, with white hair and a white moustache. Glasses hung up on the tip of his red nose, as if somehow he was looking down on Pete, even though that was physically impossible. Yep, things are fine, Pete blurted. Mr. Watson frowned, glad to hear it. Now please return to your dissection lab. You all, you of all cannot afford to fail. That's what I'm doing, Pete muttered, whirling around. It all went downhill from there. Pete took a quick, long stride and his foot landed on the pack on his back on his pack strap instead of landing securely on the floor. That was when he slipped, losing his footing, falling backward. He felt his toe connect with leather jacket guy in a br brutal way. The kid yelped and Mr. Watson shouted something in reply. Pete landed on his back, his breath knocked out of him. He blinked and when he opened his eyes, he spotted the kid's scalpel in the air. The small knife must have flown up on impact, but then, in disbelief, Pete saw the scalpel lose gravity and fall toward his face. Oops, sorry, I, lo I lost the place where I am. No, this is the worst part. part. Uh, the point of the tiny blade coming straight for his eye. Oh, <laughs> adrenaline spurted through his body. With the quick reflexes that came from years of playing football, Pete swatted the tool away like a deadly insect just as the blade was about to blind him. The scalpel hit the stand of the workstation and fell to the floor. Holy! Leather jacket guy hissed. Dear Lord Peter, are you alright? said Mr. Watson, hovering over him like a frightened parent. Don't move, I'll call the nurse. Class, stay, seat stay seated. Nobody move. Emergency procedure, please. Out of the way. The class ignored Mr. Watson, Mots Watson and crowded around Pete as his chest rose up and down with heavy breaths. He didn't think he'd hit his head, but he felt dizzy and kind of out of it. Not to mention, mortified. Someone whispered. Way to go, Dingleberry. A couple of kids giggled. Yeah, what a loser. Now we know why he was kicked off the, off the football team. Pete slowly sat up as his face flushed red. Dang, there was no doubt he should have stayed home. Somehow, Pete managed to get through the rest of the school day. The nurses checked him out and given him an ice pack and sent him on his way. It was a relief when the final bell rang and he walked quickly around slow-moving kids, though the doors... Uh, sorry, through the doors and down the school's front steps. When he checked his phone, he saw he had a new text from his mother. He rubbed her hand over his face. What now? Couldn't he get through one day without her asking him to do something? Yeah, he loved his mum. But now that she didn't have his dad to help her, Pete was always on call. She better not ask him to take Chuck out again. He wouldn't do it. He'd say, nope, sorry, I'm sick. He clicked on the text. Hi Pete, after school could you swing by the butcher and pick up an order of pork chops? He responded flatly, fine. She responded, thank you, heart emoji. <laughs> Pete popped a wad of watermelon gum into his mouth and set off walking to the butcher shop, which was a couple of blocks out of his way. He wanted to get his license, and that was the plan six months ago before the divorce, but now everyone seemed to have forgotten. He finally arrived at Barney's butcher shop during a lull. Lull? Okay, I don't know what that means. No cars were parked in front, which was perfect because he could get the order and get out fast. Pete pushed through the gla glass door and no one was even behind the counter. Sale prices were posted on the glass and some old rock music was pe playing from the back. <clears throat> he walked to the display case of raw meats, scanning left then right. Hello? He called out. Yo, I got an order to pick up. There wasn't a bell to ring. So he stood around for another minute waiting for someone to help him. When no one came, he'd about had it. He knocked on the glass counter a couple of times. Hello! Finally, he took matters into his own hands, walking behind the tall display case. Hey, anyone here or not? 
On the other side of the case was a long butcher table with watery red, red liquid on it. The overpowering scent of meat and of blood made his gut swish around again. The gum in his mouth turned sour. He put a hand to his stomach as if to ease it. I will not blow chunks. I will not blow chunks, he thought. He looked around to distract himself, but all he saw were pictures of butchered animals. When he craned his head in another direction, he was surrounded by rows of lethal-looking knives and cleavers hanging above his head. A new wave of dizziness washed over him. He set his hand out for balance on the butcher table, felt the watery liquid on his fingertips, and broke out in a cold sweat. Wham! <laughs> a huge meat cleaver slammed down into the wood, barely missing his wrist. Pete shot backward, protecting his hand against his chest, knocking into the display case with his pack. He gazed at the meat cleaver embedded in the wood. The handle vibrated in the air as if the force had been incredibly strong. His gaze whipped up toward the hanging tools. One empty hook was swaying slowly. The meat cleaver had fallen from the hook. Fallen? He didn't think something could fall so forcefully on its own. But what else could have happened? Hey, what are you doing back here? A stocky older man wearing a bloody apron waddled into the area, wiping his hands with a towel. Employees only. Can't you read the signs? Pete pointed to the cleaver stuck in the butcher table. I, I... Ah, now nah, you can't be playing with my knives. You trying to get me in trouble, kid? Health department will have me a license. I, I... Spit it out. What's the matter? I didn't touch anything. It j just fell. The old man narrowed his eyes. No way these knives fall from these hooks. If that were the ones... If that were the case, I'd be missing a lot more fingers than the ones I already cu cut off. The old man raised his left hand to show a missing pinky and a ring finger with its top lobbed off. The skin looked smooth on the two oddly shaped finger stumps. When Pete started to shake, the old the man laughed. Scared? Never seen someone with missing fingers before? Well, keep your fingers and hands away from sharp objects, kid, and you should be just fine. Maybe. He cracked up again. Pete swallowed hard. Just here to pick up an order for Dinglewood. The butcher waved... Sorry. The butcher waved a hand toward the back room. Yeah, got that in the fridge. Chops, right? I'll be right with you. Pete whipped open the front door to his house and slammed it as soon as he'd stormed through. He tossed his pack on the floor and strode to the kitchen, where he opened the fridge, threw the chops in, and grabbed a soda. He shut the door with his hip and chugged the whole can. The cola soothed his throat and the sweetness calmed him a little. What a freaky day! He took off his cap and ran his hand over his head. He just needed to eat, rest and forget about everything else. No more crazy dreams or weird kids with scalpels and definitely no more butcher shops. His mum was going to have to pick up the meat herself from now on. He glanced out the kitchen window when he heard the backyard gate creak open. Chuck pushed his bike in and leaned it on the side of the house before coming through the side door. Pete felt his irritation bubble up. Are you crazy? He asked Chuck. If mum finds out you biked to school, someone hogged the bathroom this morning and I was late for the bus. And I didn't pick you up. I'm busted. I won't tell. Yeah, right. You always snitch. Chuck rolled his eyes. I didn't tell her about you forcing me into the maintenance room, did I? Not yet. But I saw how you wanted to tell her last night at dinner. You thought you were real funny. Chuck held up his hands in exasperation. Well, I didn't. That has to count for something. Pete shrugged. Still, you can't be trusted. Fine. I should just tell her to get you busted. How about that? See, you are a snitch. Shut up. You are. You shut up, you little twerp. Chuck gave in. Whatever, jerkwad, he muttered. He grabbed a loaf of bread from the bread box, then the peanut butter from the pantry, then the jelly from the fridge. He pulled a butter knife from the drawer and started to make himself a sandwich. When he saw Pete eyeing his sandwich, he lifted his eyebrows. What? You want one? Pete hesitated. Dunno. Well, make your own. Pete held a hand to his stomach, debating if he could handle it. You still sick or something? Chuck wanted to know. He shrugged. Just an off day. Why? What happened? Pete snapped. Don't worry about it. None of your business. No freaking way he would tell anyone about the embarrassing incident in bio class and the flying cleavers. Especially not his twerp brother who would run and tell mum and freak her out. Fine. Chuck finished making the sandwich and slid it across the counter toward Pete. A peace offering? Pete lifted his eyebrows in surprise as Chuck began making another. You know Mum filled out that organ donor paperwork for us, Chuck said like it was a casual conversation. Pete's jaw dropped. What? Why? 
Chuck nodded, flashing his braces, looking almost pleased. She said she'd come around the idea eventually, but I told her not to. Since when does mum ever listen to what we want? Chuck took a bite of his sandwich and kept talking with his mouth full. It's not a big deal anyway. You're dead when they take your organs. Your life or soul or whatever is gone. What do I care? Why do you even care so much? Pete didn't even know where to start. He Here he was, trying to save his body parts all day long, and his mum was just trying to give them away. It's... It's just a stupid idea. Chuck gave him a curious look. Wait, you're scared, aren't you? No, shut up. I looked it up. You want to know how they cut into you and take your organs? It's so cool. They split you open like in a Y incision. Then your guts are all hanging out. Then they remove everything piece by piece. He made a face with his eyes rolled back and his tongue hanging out. Your intestines are super long, right? So they just pull them out like a long rope of link sausage. Chuck made a motion with his hands like he was pulling out a long piece of rope from his stomach. I said to shut up. Pete grabbed the sandwich and fled to his room. Interesting. <laughs> the next morning, Pete sipped from his triple caffeine energy drink as he walked to school. The sun was out, which improved the walk a lot. Today had to be better than yesterday, he figured. Last night he had weird dreams again, but luckily the details drifted away as soon as he woke up. And there hadn't been any spewing his guts into the toilet, so that was a score. He'd barely spoken to his mum last night or this morning. Why had she signed him up as a donor when he told her not to? He didn't even want to eat the pork chops he'd picked up last night. All they did was remind him that he'd nearly lost his hand. When he passed a construction site, he paused a moment. He looked across the street and decided against crossing with all the busy traffic. Instead, he'd go right under the scaffolding. Pete scanned the boards above him, making sure there weren't any weird tools that would fall on his head. He heard motorised saws and drills sounding from the site, but nothing coming from the scaffolding. When he figured he was safe, he relaxed a little. Just in case, he walked cautiously under the boards with quick glances above him. One thing he'd learnt recently was that he couldn't be too careful. As he neared the end of the scaffolding, he took a breath of relief. Piece of cake. From inside the site, he heard a funny buzz and then a harsh clank. The hairs on Pete's arms stood up. What the hell? Watch out! Someone shouted. Pete spotted something moving fast in his peripheral vision. His head turned in time to see a circular buzzsaw of a blade flying in his direction, reminding him of a flying frisbee with sharp teeth. His jaw went slack. His adrenaline spiked. He dove backwards as the round blade flew through the air toward him. He held up his hand in defence, like maybe he could catch it, and then he realised it was the worst thing to do, and tried to pull his hand out of the path of the flying blade. He thought it was home free when he felt it slice through his flesh uh, just above his wrist followed by a sharp stinging, oh my god. He crashed to the ground, his drink pouring over him. Air gushed out of his lungs. His eyes were wide as he lifted his arm, watching in shock as blood poured out his skin. Oh man, kid, someone call 911. A construction worker rushed to his side, grabbing onto his helmet as if not sure what to do with his hands. Let me get a clean rag, just don't move. The worker ran off and other people started to gather around. Kid, are you okay? A man in a suit stood above Leet and uh, Leet, Pete and leaned down. He had a phone to his ear. Hello, yeah, there's been an accident. There's a teenager, he's bleeding on the arm. Uh, at a construction site on Wellington and Salisbury? Hurry, please, don't worry, kid. Help is on the way. Y yes, yes, he is conscious. Dazed, Pete glanced at the open gash on his arm. It wasn't very deep, but he could have died. That's pretty gruesome. <laughs> Pete! Mum yelled as soon as she stepped into the house. Pete! In my room, he called out. He was lying on his bed, staring at the ceiling. After the paramedic bandaged him up at the construction site, he called his mum and walked back home. He didn't even want to wait for a ride, he wanted to get as far away from the construction site as possible. Now his energy was spent. He'd noticed his back was sore, so he'd gone to the bathroom and lifted his shirt in front of the mirror. As if his sliced arm wasn't bad enough, he also had a bunch of fresh scratches on his back from falling on the sidewalk. Yesterday he'd had a couple of close calls, but this latest incident was more dangerous. This time there was actual blood. Mum swept into his bedroom in a flurry of nerves. Oh my gosh, oh my baby! Pete sighed. Mum, I'm okay, it's a small wound, I don't need stitches, everything is fine. She grabbed his hand, scanning the bandage on his arm. How did this happen? She felt his cheek, ran a hand uh, over his head and gave a kiss on his forehead. Pete looked at his arm and answered honestly, don't know really. Her eyes went wide. 
What do you mean you don't know? Were you not paying attention? Was the construction worker being negligent? Do we need to call a lawyer? Maybe we should go to the hospital. No, okay, mum, just relax, jeez. While it was nice to have all of her attention for once, her anxiety put him on edge. No, I am not relaxing. You could really... Wait, no, I'm not relaxing. You could have really gotten hurt, sorry. She straightened and crossed her arms with a determined look on her face. That's it. You are not walking to school anymore. You can ride a bus or get a ride. Maybe I can change my schedule. I'll drive you and your brother to school. I think I can make it all work. Then she placed her hands on her hips as if she were suddenly Wonder Woman and there was nothing that could stop her. I will make it work. Mum, stop. It was just a freak accident, which he'd been having a lot of recently. There was a knock at the front door before it swung open. Pete shot up in his bed, startled. Who the hell is that? Pete, your language. Hello, anybody home? Bellowed a familiar voice. Pete stared at his mum accusingly. You called Dad? <laughs> oh no. She said, Of course I called your father. Over here, Bill, in Pete's room. Quickly, she started to pick up dirty clothes that were thrown on the floor. I have to call him when there's an emergency. Gosh, Pete, this room is a mess. Like that was anything new. Dad filled the hallway, wearing cargo pants and a t-shirt, with his pockets breast and a floppy canvas hat. There was a forced smile buried under his scruffy beard. There's my boy. You were fishing? Mum asked him, surprised. No, not yet. I took the rest of the day off, making it an early weekend. I'm here to take my first born with me to the lake. How are you doing there, Pete? Let's see that arm. He stepped. His dad stepped towards the bed, kicking water bottles as he went. His jaw hardened, but he hadn't said anything about the mess. Pete raised his arm for his dad's inspection, unsure what to make of his visit. He hadn't seen his dad in a couple of months, only talked to him on the phone a few times. Suddenly he was home, like, really home. He hadn't been inside the house in nearly six months. It used to be so normal to have mum and dad home together, and now it felt super awkward. Dad made a, huh, sound, like a villager. Doesn't look too bad. You'll be good as new before you know it. Um, yeah, well, I don't think I'm up to fishing today, dad. In fact, he knew he wasn't up for it. He was sore and he wanted to lay down and go to sleep. Pete gave his mum a pleading look. Help me. She hesitated. He's tired, Bill. Maybe another time. It's been a crazy morning. Dad waved a hand. Nonsense, he's fine. Fishing calms the nerves and relaxes the mind. Come on now, get ready to go, Pete. I've got sandwiches already packed. It's going to be a great time, you'll see. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Something's going to go wrong here, right? The sun was brutal even through a haze of clouds. Pete leaned back in a folding chair next to his dad on an old pier. A cooler sat between them and an old tackle box was spread open at his dad's feet. Pete's arm was sore, so he didn't do much casting of the fishing line. Instead he took in the scene. A handful of small boats were in the lake with people, mostly old people, fishing in them. Every few minutes the water rippled in a stiff breeze and brought, it, and brought with it the scent of decaying fish and plants. Pete couldn't remember his dad catching any fish at the local lake. He wondered if anyone caught anything here. Ever. It seemed weird, fishing alone with his dad. It had probably been a couple of years since they'd been to the lake, and Chuck was usually tagging along, filling the silence with a bunch of questions for dad. Chuck always had to know things. Why something worked, or how it worked, or where things were made. Pete wasn't sure if Chuck really wanted the answers or the attention, but either way, he was used to it. Chuck liked to ask questions, and Pete didn't care to talk much. So, Pete, I want to know how you're doing, Dad said. Pete lifted his hat, scratched his head, and slipped his cap back on. I'm fine, Dad. Your mother says you'd stopped playing football and hadn't been getting along much with your brother. His dad didn't use an accusing tone, but Pete could feel his disapproval, just like he had with his messy room. His dad always acted like it was Pete's fault when things went the wrong way. Outside events, like, say, parental actions, didn't come into the equation. It must be cool to be an adult and be right all the time, Pete thought. Pete shrugged, even though his dad wasn't looking at him. I'm done with football. It's not for me anymore. The breeze blew and someone's fishing line flew past Pete's face. He flinched and looked at a guy floating in his boat a couple of yards away, paying no attention to where he was casting his line. Oh god, this is, this is the recipe for a disaster. His dad said, alright, there's your choice about football. But you're Chuck's bigger brother and there's no choice in that. Pete didn't exactly want to be reminded, but his dad went on. And as a bigger brother, you need to be responsible. 
I was a big brother to your Aunt Lucy. Still am when she needs me. She's got a husband now, so she doesn't depend on me as much anymore. At the topic of husband, he seemed to get a little uncomfortable. Pete ground his teeth together. Too bad he forgot his gum. Lectures were always boring and a waste of airspace, but at least gum would have been a distraction. He stared out across the lake, hoping something might break up this uncomfortable moment. But anyway, sometimes responsibility can be a lot for a kid, his dad said, clearing his throat. You know, with school, grades, and girls making you feel funny. His dad gave him a side glance. Got any questions about girls? Pete's cheeks burned and, his, and he shook his head adamantly in the negative. Okay, well my point is, if you need to talk to someone, I'm here for you, son. His dad turned to him fully, then um, staring like he was waiting for Pete to say something big. I think he thinks he's, like, <laughs> depressed, <laughs> you, you know, and, he, and he's doing these things intentionally. Pete frowned. Uh, okay. His dad ran a hand, a hand down his beard. Or if it's easier to talk to a stranger, I can find you a counsel- Yes! <laughs> I, I got it right like a few lines before. I, I can find you a counsellor. What? No, I don't need a counsellor. Well, with your wrist- I was right on the bullseye there. Well, with your wrist. His eyes went to Pete's bandage. What about it? It was an accident. His dad's gaze became more intense. Was it really, Pete? Pete jerked back. You think I did this to myself? I've heard divorce can affect families in different ways. I didn't hurt myself, Dad. Jeez. Pete scrubbed a hand down his face in frustration. A fishing line zipped by his face again and he jerked to the left to avoid it. If only the old guys would watch where they're doing. There's no judgement, son. If you did. Just want you to remember that I'm always here for you and your brother. Pete laughed suddenly and harshly. You keep saying that. I've barely seen you since the divorce. You not here for me or Chuck. You and Mum expect me to take your place with him. Pete thought he would feel better after getting the truth out, but he just felt bad. There was a funny feeling in his chest, like someone putting a hand down there and pushing hard. Dad's shoulders slumped. That's not true, Pete. I live across town and you know I odd work odd hours. I'm doing the best I can. You and Chuck need to know that. I mean, I'll try harder. I love you both. Yeah, Pete heard that from both of his parents, but words weren't enough anymore. If Pete wanted to, he could really just cry night now, but crying hurt even worse than getting mad, so he decided on mad. This, Pete lifted his bandaged arm to his dad's face, was a freak accident. There were witnesses, okay? Unless I used my mind to make a buzzsaw blade fly at me and try to take my hand off? Right, not freaking possible. Just take me home, dad. I'm done. Please calm down, Pete. Please, just take me home. Pete stood so quickly that his folding chair skidded back. A gust of wind blew against him, almost taking off his hat. He grabbed it before it could float away. Then he heard a very faint sound before something sharp tore into his cheek just below his eye. Something tugged his face forward. Ah! Pete! He dropped his pole as his hands flew to his face to find a fishing hook stuck to his skin. The hook was attached to a fishing line, pull it, trying to pull his skin off. He leaned forward, screaming. Shock and pain flooded through him. His heart was pounding so fast he thought it might explode out of his chest. The line was so tight, Pete stepped forward again to try and ease the pressure. There was only dark water below him, and he couldn't stop himself. I'm going to go head first into the lake, he thought. He felt his dad's arm wrap around him to keep him from falling. Hold still, his dad whipped out a small hunting knife and cut the line. The pressure instantly released. Pete hunched over in severe pain. Blood dripped into the water. His dad held him. It's okay, buddy, I've got you. He pulled him back away from the edge of the pier. I'm sorry, someone called out. Is he okay? The freaking wind blew my cast towards you guys. Can't believe it. Pete, look at me. Come on, let's see the damage. His dad leaned him back. Pete could barely see the hook sticking out of his face. His eyes watered. Snot ran from his nose and tears mixed with the blood dripping down his cheek. Dad blew out a breath. Oh yeah, got you pretty good. We will be just fine. Though we're lucky it didn't take you out. We're lucky it didn't take you out your eye. So I guess Pete had a bad day. Oh yeah. Speaking of this, I think I know what's happening. I I really have a good idea what's happening here. You know, it's all connected. Foxy singing about the eye and the arm. We'll we'll get to that. I'm sure. Pete and Dad came home and Mum rushed to Pete. His face was all bandaged up. Chuck's eyes widened. Wow, he almost looked like Frankenstein. But he'd have to save that nickname for another day. How did this happen? Mum practically shrieked. Oh, Pete, your poor face. Hey there, Chuck, my boy. Hi, Dad, said Chuck. 
gave a little wave. He remembers when he was little, and he used to climb his dad's legs until he picked him up. Chuck wondered when he'd stop doing that. Dad threw his hands in the air. Now, Audrey, let's stay calm. It was a freak accident. A hook caught him in the cheek. It wasn't too bad, so I was able to patch him up myself. Her eyes widened. Another freak accident! On the same day! How is that even possible? Dad ran a hand down his beard. Not sure. I think he needs to stay in bed, get some rest. I'm sure these accidents all passed. Yes! Resting was what he was supposed to be doing! Mum snapped. It was your bright idea to take him to the lake so he could get hooked by a fish. Not by a fish. Like a fish. <laughs> Why weren't you looking out for him? Dad whipped off his canvas hat, revealing his bald head. Audrey, that's not fair. He was sitting right next to me. It was a windy day. A freak thing. Pete collapsed on the couch. He looked dazed as he watched his mum and dad go back and forth, talking about him. Chuck wasn't so used to seeing his brother look so... so vulnerable. He was bigger than him, mouthy, and always annoying. Now sitting on the couch, he seemed small and almost frail. Chuck went and sat next to Pete, staring at his brother's face. You look like Frankenstein. Bad, Pete. Does it hurt? What do you think? He muttered. Chuck nodded as if he understood. Pretty bad day, huh? So, what do you think is going on with you? Did you walk under a ladder, break a mirror, cross a black cat? Pete frowned. What are you talking about? He asked. What did you do to earn a streak of bad luck? Pete just shook his head. It's not bad luck, and I'm not accident, accident prone, he insisted. I don't know what it is. Chuck licked his dry lips and leaned closer to his brother. It's something weird though, right? First you were sick, and mum filled me in about the weird accident with the construction site, and now this fishing thing. Chuck had been thinking about the weird stuff that had piled up in his brother's life. It had all the makings of a really good puzzle. This all started when you tried to scare me at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, he's pointed out. Pete tried to scowl, scowl. Uh, but he winced as the gesture hurt his face. What? Now you're trying to say this is something like karma? Bull. No way. I don't believe in that stuff. Chuck shrugged. You can't deny it's weird. Pete was silent a moment, then said quietly. It wasn't just those things. Chuck raised his eyebrows, intrigued. What do you mean? Pete shook his head. Can't talk about it now. I'll tell you later. He nodded toward his parents, as if he didn't want them to hear. Chuck went into his room, sat on the floor in front of his TV, and started playing video games. He didn't really think Pete would tell him anything more, but a couple of hours later Pete walked into his room and sat on his bed. His cheek was puffed out below his eye and his eyes were bloodshot. Chuck paused his game and just looked at him, waiting. <laughs> in school yesterday I slipped and fell in biology class. I kicked a kid and his scalpel went flying. When I hit the ground, the scalpel was going for my eye. Chuck's mouth dropped open. No way. I knocked it away before it hit me. Chuck was impressed. Quick thinking. Pete looked pleased for a second. Yeah, when you got the skill- what else? Pete shrugged. I went to pick up the chops for the bit at the butcher for my mum, and there wasn't anybody behind the counter, so I walked in the back trying to find someone, and out of nowhere, a cleaver falls, falls from the hook and slams into the butcher's block by my hand. Holy cow, that's close. Yeah, crazy close. I mean, if I believed in weird stuff, I'd think something was up. But I don't believe in anything like curses? Pete frowned. Get real, Chuck. Chuck sighed. Why did he have to have such a stubborn brother? What else can explain this? Four times? It's gotta be something. Come on, Pete. Whatever it was, I'm done with it. Pete cleared his throat. Just in case, it's because of, you know, dragging you to see Foxy. He stuck his hand toward Chuck. Chuck's eyes widened as he looked at it. Pete lifted his eyebrows. Well? Shake? Might as well, Chuck thought. Hesitantly, he took his brother's hand and shook it. Pete took his hand back and even apologised. I'm sorry about trying to scare you. It was dumb. Let's call a truce between us, okay? Chuck smiled. Okay truce. Thanks, Pete. Pete stood up unsteadily. I'm going back to bed. Later. Later, Chuck murmured as his brother walked out of his room. Then he started thinking, rummaging through his desk for a notebook to write in. His brother may want to brush off all of his ideas, but there had to be an explanation. There had to be. There is, I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what game are you playing? Pete asked Chuck from his bedroom doorway. 
He'd spent most of Saturday in bed, and now he felt the need to get up and walk around the house. Lying in his bed gave him too much thinking time. He kept replaying each freak accident over in his head, and it wasn't cool. Just an indie adventure game, wanna check it out? Pete shrugged and sat cross-legged with his brother on the floor. Chuck's room was a lot different than Pete's. First of all, Chuck actually used his hamper instead of dropping his clothes all over the floor. His bed was made, his desk was clear of extra paper, he had a bookshelf with books on aliens and conspiracy theories. A couple of gamer posters were pinned neatly on the wall. Chuck explained the game. You see, I'm the mage and I have to look for all the hidden ingredients to make a potion to stop an evil wizard. He has my village under a spell and I need to help break the curse with the potion and release the village before it's too late. What happens if you're too late? Then I lose them forever. They remain under the control of the evil wizard, and that is not happening. Pete smirked. You like to be the hero, don't you? It's the only way to win. Want to play with me? Sure. Chuck's eyes lit up as he grabbed the other controller. You can be my apprentice. Why am I the apprentice? Why can't I be the mage and you be the sidekick? Chuck shook his head. You have a lot to learn. Pete turned to their mum, who was leaning in the doorway. She was smiling. Hey mum, Pete said. You guys need anything? How about some popcorn? Could use some popcorn, thanks. And a juice box for me, Chuck said. Pete played the game for a couple of hours and then went back to bed. He had to admit it was nice to get along with his little brother again. After shaking hands and calling a truce, it was almost like it was when they used to be little. When they didn't have a care in the world. Before the resentments, the name calling, the divorce. He had to admit he missed those days. Before Pete knew it, Sunday night rolled around and he started getting ready to go back to school. To his relief, the swelling in his face had gone down. He'd removed the bandage from his arm, exposing a fresh scab on the wound right above his wrist. Sorry, let me... Oh, there's something on my screen. <laughs> Where was I? Um, it made me think of his dad accusing him of hurting myself, of hurting himself. Sure, thoughts of escaping his parents crossed his mind sometimes, but not the way his dad was thinking. Pete had spent most of the day binge-watching uh, TV. He hadn't dared to leave the house, afraid he'd have to he'd have another freak accident. Not that his mum would have not that his mum would have let him leave anyway. She'd kept a close eye on him all weekend, really stepped up for him. Maybe he'd cut her some slack when she started piling on a bunch of stuff for him to do again. If all these freak accidents had been some weird karma thing, he'd apologise to Chuck, hadn't he? So that would mean that he should be clear and free of whatever it was. But he had a feeling that that lingered in his guts like a sickness. He worried that everything might not be over, that it might never be. Then there was a knock on the door. Come in, he called out, and Chuck stuck his head in. Normally he'd yell at him to get the heck out of his room, but things were different this, with this truce. Picking on his little brother didn't seem as much fun anymore. Not that he'd tell him that. Yeah, Pete said. His brother stepped in with a notebook in one hand and closed the door behind him. He fished his inhaler out of his shorts pocket, took a puff, then slipped it back in. How you doing? He asked Pete. Okay, I guess. You ready to go back to school tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, right. Chuck flashed his braces and ran a hand through his hair. Just checking. What's up with the notebook? Something I've been working on this weekend since you told me about the accident. Chuck walk over to, walked over to Pete, flipped open his notebook and showed him some sort of handwritten chart. There were five boxes arranged in a circle, with arrows pointing between them. On the top of the chart was a box labelled Foxy the Pirate. The following boxes read Bio Class, Butcher Shop, Construction Site and Lake. The final arrow pointed back to Foxy the Pirate. What's this mean? Pete wanted to know. It means I think the point of origin where this all started was in the maintenance room with Foxy. Yeah, we already talked about that. And from there, each freak accident led to the next. And now, in order for all of this to be over, you have to go back and fix whatever you did in the first place. I did. I apologise for this stupid prank, okay? Everything should be good now. You forgive me, right? Yeah, we're brothers. Of course I forgive you, Chuck said. But in all the games I play, you have to face the ultimate bad guy, the villain. Just like with the game we played last night, the mage had to fight the evil wizard in the end in order to set the village free with the potion. Pete forced a laugh and his stomach curdled in dread. Bad guy? Who? Foxy the animatronic? Maybe, but what exactly happened after I ran out of there that day? Pete looked back at his TV, glimpsing an action movie. Nothing. Foxy sang a song and then I left. No big deal. You can be a pirate, but you'll have to lose an eye and an arm. Yar. I'm not as good as that anymore. <laughs> 
Um, Pete's pulse picked up as he heard the words in his head. What was the song, Pete? He shook his head. Just a stupid song about being a pirate. What were the words exactly? Who cares what the words were? I do. Please, Pete, it's important. Fine. Something about how if you want to be a pirate, you have to lose an eye and an arm. See? Stupid. Chuck licked his dry lips. Then he grabbed a pencil from Pete's cluttered desk and started writing. What are you doing? Hold on a sec. After a minute, he shoved the notebook into Pete's hands. Chuck had written additional notes under the boxes. Foxy the pirate. Pirate song. Lose eye, lose arm. Bio class. Nearly lost eye. Butcher shop. Nearly lost arm. Construction site. Nearly lost arm. Lake. Nearly lost eye. Pete shook his head in denial. No, he muttered as he started to shake. You're, you're wrong. You can't ignore the facts, Pete. Foxy wants you to become a pirate, and the accidents are getting more dangerous. No, he yelled. Foxy is a damn robot. He's made of metal and gears. He ripped out the page of the notebook and started to shred it. This is all made up in your messed up gamer brain. It's fantasy, not real. Pete, stop. Shut up. Get out of my room. He shoved his brother and threw his notebook at him. Chuck stumbled back in shock, his face turning red. I'm trying to help you. Pete jammed a finger in the air toward Chuck. No, you're trying to scare me for all the times I've scared you. It's always winning with you, right? Well, this isn't some game for you to win. I know that. I'm not trying to win. I'm trying to figure this out. Mum appeared at the door. Boys, what's all the yelling? What's going on? Tell Chuck the chimp to get out of my room. Ch the chimp? I meant chump. Don't call me that Frankenstein face. Pete's face scrunched up. Oh, you've been waiting to use that one, haven't you? You're going to pay for that. Truce is officially over. Fine by me. You can take your stupid truce and jam it up your nose. Boys, calm down, Mum yelled. I said, get out of my room. I am. Chuck scooped up his notebook and ran out. Pete turned his back to his mum. After a moment, with an exaggerated sigh, she closed the door. Pete was so freaking angry, he started to cry. Pete tossed and turned in bed, since his mind was wide awake. His pyjamas felt too warm, his blankets too heavy. His bedroom was dark except for the moonlight that filtered through the curtain. He thought he could... He thought he saw... Oh, sorry. Through the curtain on the window. As he stared at the curtain, he thought he saw something dark flash be behind the fabric. Pete got to his feet and walked to the window, pushing the curtain aside. The front yard was quiet. A car was parked at the curb. A row of trees lined the street, nothing out of the ordinary. He rolled his shoulders to release his tension, then went back to bed. He hit his pillow a couple of times to get comfortable. Then he stared at the ceiling and stared some more. No use, he still couldn't fall asleep. A moment passed as he found his eyes lured back to the window. Don't get up, don't look. But he couldn't help himself. Something felt strange. He was alone in his room, but he felt like he was being watched which was completely stupid. Sighing, he stood and walked back to the window, again pushing the curtain aside. He was about to step away. Oh my god, I keep losing where I am. Uh, he was about to step away when he caught a movement behind the tree. Sorry about that. Uh, was someone there? Pete's pulse raced. He rubbed his eyes, blinked, and searched for more movement, but nothing was there. His mind was messing with him. He was freaking paranoid. He took a breath and released it. It was probably just the wind blowing the branches. He scrubbed his hands down his face and lay back down in bed. The wind howled, and somehow that calmed him a little. Then the backyard gate creaked. The gate must have come unlatched in the wind, right? Just to be certain, Pete listened carefully. An owl hooted. A door creaked. A second later, he jerked upright, his heart pounding. Was that creaking inside the house? He crept to his bedroom door and slowly opened it. He searched the empty hallway. No one was lurking around. He was starting to really freak himself out. Mum and Chuck were asleep. No one else was in the house. Just go to sleep, he told himself. He stomped to his bed, threw himself down, and squeezed his eyes shut. He thought he heard a fo footstep. Just go to sleep. The door creaked outside his... The floor creaked outside his door, and a chill crept down his spine. No one else is here. Wait, isn't that isn't that the lines from uh, the break room in Sister Location? <laughs> just go back to sleep. No one else is here. He told himself it was just his imagination. 
but the air seemed to shift around him. The hairs on his arms stood up and he couldn't deny his unease anymore. When he opened his eyes, Foxy stood above him. Terror, st terror sucked the air from Pete's lungs. He couldn't move, couldn't speak. Foxy's yellow eyes glowed in the darkness of the room. His jaw hung open, flashing sharp teeth. Foxy lifted his hook and slashed the sharp tip in front of Pete's face, the metal whizzing by his nose. Pete shoved himself off the bed, his body shaking, but he couldn't let get off the floor. Foxy pirouetted, looming over him. The shifting of gears filled the room as Foxy swung up with his hook. You can be a pirate, but you'll first have to lose an iron arm. No, Pete breathed. Foxy slammed his hook into Pete's eye, and there was an audible pop. Blood poured from his eye socket as Pete screamed. Foxy's mechanical foot slammed onto his right arm, crushing muscle and grinding against bone. <laughs> Pete convulsed in agony. Agony, there we go. He tried to push Foxy off of him. Too heavy, too strong. Pete's heart pounded. Tears and blood ran down his face. Foxy hacked down, his hook tearing into Pete's hand, splintering bone and tearing muscle until it was ripped off completely. Foxy lifted his hook and watched Pete's hand dangle, blood spilling down. Pete screamed. How gruesome. <laughs> he woke up screaming into his pillow. Since he was finding it hard to breathe, he bolted up, gasping for air. Sweat stuck in his shirt, stuck stuck his shirt to his skin. Sunlight was beaming through his window. He was home, in his bedroom, alone. He spread his hands out, fingers wide, and saw that they were attached. He reached for both eyes, and both were still there. He was alive, and he could see. All body parts were intact. He took a deep breath of relief. Just a nightmare. Why did it have to seem so real? Pete swallowed hard as the stomach turned, and he started to tremble. He felt as if he'd had a version of the same dream before, but this time, he remembered every detail. With a hood pulled over his head, Pete walked into North Hillside High School on Monday morning and gaped at the huge sign hanging in the hallway. Find your treasure on the high seas, homecoming carnival today at lunch. A pirate head was drawn under the slogan saying, Aye matey, while flashing a hook for a hand. Pete nearly turned around and walked home, but he knew how nervous his mum had been when she dropped him off to school. Everything's going to be okay, Pete, she'd said, like she was trying to convince herself. Yeah, mum, everything will be fine, he'd reassured her. Mum? Yes, honey? You're a good mum. She blinked rapidly and smiled. Thank you, son. You make me very happy. The truth was, he hoped everything would be fine. He realised that all he wanted was to have everything back to normal, with boring classes and unnecessary tests and even taking care of his little brother. He was ready for all it to be over, and now he could see that he had an okay life even if his parents weren't together. His parents loved him and Chuck, even though they were often wrapped up in their own stories and obligations. He had a nice and comfortable home, a few friends. He wasn't one of the kids to make the best out of high school, but he'd get through it like everybody else. He walked further down the hall, taking in the posters on the walls. There were pirate ships, parrots, skulls and crossbones, and pirate heads everywhere he turned. The student council always went all out for homecoming week. He could feel people gaping at the mess on his face, but he tried not to pay attention as they whispered and pointed. He walked to his locker and spun the co combo, taking care to avoid a kid in a pirate's costume and an eye patch. He unloaded some overdue homework from his pack then pulled out his biology book for his first class. Dude, what happened to your face? Duncan Thompson asked him. Duncan was Pete's locker neighbour, a short and stocky dude with a buzzed head. They used to play football together. For his version of school spirit, he had skulls and crossbones painted on both of his cheeks. Pete shrugged as he shut his locker. Fishing accident. No big deal. Like, how? You get cut with a knife or something? Pete didn't want to go into the details, something like that. Makes you look so gnarly though, like nobody should mess with you, you know what I mean? Pete cracked the smile. Cool. Gonna miss you at the homecoming game this week, dude. You would have looked pretty intimidating on the field, sporting a fresh scar on your face. Yeah, thanks, Pete said. Duncan smiled and held up his fist. Pete bumped it. He walked away from his locker feeling a little better. 
He held his head high as people watched him, ignoring the stupid pirate decorations and costumes. Yeah, he had the don't mess with me vibe going on, and he liked it. Pete's morning classes went smoothly. He didn't dare get up from his seat during class, and he stayed far away from any sharp objects. When the lunch bell rang, he felt surprisingly good, as if he really did end his streak of freak accidents. Now he just needed to make amends with his little brother. The worst part was that he had made amends before he'd blown it again by yelling at Chuck and kicking her out of his room. He just didn't want to believe what Chuck believed, that it wasn't all over yet, that he had to go back to face Foxy. Pete shivered. He'd apologise to Chuck and reinstate their truce, and Chuck would understand, he was pretty sure. His little brother seemed to forgive him easily. Pete was really ready to start fresh, as his mum would say sometimes. It would be like a new beginning. He never really understood what she meant by that until now. The sun was out as he stepped out into the school courtyard where the carnival was happening. Food booths and games were set up and spread about. Kids roamed around eating cotton candy and junk food. There was a water dunk tank with their vice principal, Mr. Sanchez, waiting to be dunked. A pie eating contest was set up, along with an arm wrestling table, water gun races and more. A DJ was playing music and giving away t-shirts. Pete pulled off his hood and walked around, hoping to find something good to eat. Not long after he started browsing, he ran into Maria. She was working in a booth. Oh, hi Pete, she said. She was wearing a red scarf around her head and big round earrings. Whoa, what happened to you? She pointed to her own cheek. Hey Maria, Pete shrugged. It was a dumb fishing accident. Ouch, that sucks. Seems like you haven't been around that much. Pete's eyebrows raised. She had noticed? Uh, yeah, some stuff going on. Everything is cool, though. She nodded as if she understood. So, you want to win something? All you have to do is stick your hand in this box and see what you get. She nodded at a large table with a hole in the centre. Pete stuck his hands in his jean pockets. No, it's cool. I'm good. She smiled. Come on, it's just for fun. Don't you want a prize? Pete's stomach quivered as he pulled out his right hand. Closing, closing his grip into a fist. All the freaky stuff was over, he assured himself. He was safe now. Sure, I guess. Hesitantly, he stuck his hand in the hole, and after a few seconds, it was surrounded by something. What the heck? Maria let out a small laugh. What'd you get? He tucked his hand back, but it was stuck. He pulled harder, and the grip on the hand had tightened. Unease, oh yeah, unease rippled through him. Sweat sprouted on his forehead. Pete planted his feet and tugged so hard on the table, start, uh, so hard the table started to lift. Pete, stop! You're going to break the table, Maria said. My hand's stuck. I know, Pete. Calm down. Maria knocked on the table really hard. Okay, stop. I said to stop. Suddenly, Pete got out his hand, and it was attached to something that looked like a Chinese finger trap, except it was big enough to cover his entire hand. Pete stared at it in dis disbelief. The stronger he had pulled, the tighter the trap had gripped his hand. Maria looked guilty. I'm sorry, Pete, it's just a joke we've been playing on the students. You know, just a little fun for homecoming. Everyone else thought it was funny. I'm not everyone else, he snapped. A kid popped his head out of the hole in the table. His hair was spiky, and he had an earring in his nose. Dude, relax. Take a joke, why don't you? Pete didn't even know what to say. He was that freaked out. Not cool, he stammered, trying to pull the trap off his head. Somehow, it just gripped tighter, squeezing off his circulation. He swallowed hard. It felt like little tiny knives poking under his skin. Get this off of me. Wait, I'll help you. I know how to do it. Maria rushed out of the booth to Pete and pushed the trap closer to his hand so that it would eventually loosen. I'm sorry you're so upset. Yeah, right. Just get it off already, he said barely holding it together. I'm trying, okay? It's stuck for some reason. Hold on. She ran back around the booth to grab something. It wasn't just stuck. It was squeezing tighter and tighter. His hand started to throb with pain. Not again, was all he could think. Hey, the kid in the box whined. Don't cut it. Then we can't use it anymore. Maria came back with scissors. I have to. It's not coming loose. She cut from the open end of the trap until she finally freed his hand. By the time she got it off, Pete's skin looked completely purple 
and felt completely numb. Oh god, no. Purple guy number three. He opened and closed his grip to get the circulation going again. Maria's eyes widened. Oh my gosh, Pete, I'm so sorry. I can't believe this happened. It's a freak. Don't say it. He cut her off. You just shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have tried to trick me. I thought we were cool. We are, when her cheeks reddened and she bowed her head. Pete's throat tightened. I said sorry, Pete. Look, whatever, no big deal, I gotta go. Then before she could say anything else, he stormed off, trying to calm his nerves as he rubbed his hand. What a stupid joke. How is that even funny? And there was another freak thing. He swallowed hard as his throat squeezed even more. He couldn't take any more accidents. He just couldn't, or he'd lose his mind. A rush of kids suddenly surrounded him like a herd of cattle, shoving him through the doorway of a mirror maze as they ran inside. Hey, watch out, he yelled. He tried to get them out of the pack, but there were too many of them. He just pressed against the wall as they finally passed by, laughing and screaming. Dude, look, there's like 20 of us in the mirrors, someone called out as they disappeared. Pete tried to get back out through the entrance, but somehow he found himself lost in the freaking mirror maze. He walked in the opposite direction to get directly to the exit. Instead, though, he came to a dead end, and a pirate appeared in the mirror with a hat slanted to cover his face and a lethal hook attached to his arm. When he finally moved the hat, Pete could see that the pirate had a face of a fox. Pete flinched. He looked behind him, thinking the fox pirate would be standing there, but there was only another mirror. His heartbeat picked up speed and his brain emptied of every thought but one. Have to get out of here. He turned and turned narrow corridors, fleeing for the exit. Images of the fox pirate and himself were reflected in every mirror. When he ran, the fox ran. Sweat dripped down Pete's face. All he knew was that he couldn't let the fox pirate catch him. He was breathing hard when he finally saw a light, light at the end of a small mirrored corridor. But before he could get there, the fox pirate jumped in front of him, raising his hook. As if by instinct, Pete reared back and punched the fox pirate in the nose. Then the pirate stumbled back, a hand to his mask, as Pete rushed out. Pete was practically hyperventilating as he stepped back into the carnival. He was unsteady and off balance, as if he'd just come off a carousel. Kids laughed and stared, and stared at qu as questions circled around and around in his mind. Where do I go? What do I do? He stepped backwards and collided with someone. He whirled around to see a clown with a pirate hat. The clown waved, but Pete shoved him and ran toward a tent pushing toward the flaps of the heavy canvas. He needed to get out of the carnival, but he was so mixed up he didn't know where he was going. He found himself rushing into a booth with several balloons pinned to a wall. A dart came at him and scraped his cheek. He hit the, one, the next one away with his hand. Someone yelled, hey, there's a kid there. Pete himself sprang forward to tell them to stop, but it was too late. That was when the last dart hit home, sticking into the skin beside his inner eye. He yelped in pain. Kids gasped. Someone screamed. Pete reached up slowly and pulled the dart out. A trickle of blood dribbled down his face. He threw the dart down and sprinted out the other end of the tent, panicking. He ran into another tent. Exotic birds were caged inside, tweeting and squawking. A parrot shrieked, Lose an eye! Lose an arm! <laughs> Pete halted and whirled toward the bird. His body was shaking. What did you say? Squawk, squawk! <laughs> the bird was bright green with a black beak. It flapped its wings at Pete. Squawk! Pete grabbed the cage and shook it. Feathers scattered. All the birds in the tent started to go crazy. What did you say, you stupid bird? Foxy, are you in there? No. It didn't make any sense for Foxy to be inside the bird, but Pete didn't care. Since when did any of this make any sense at all? Whatever was happening to him was still happening to him, and he'd had enough. You're going. You're not going to win. You hear me? You are not going to win. Hey, kid. Take it easy. Someone grabbed Pete's shoulder and turned him around. What's the matter with you? Pete pulled away from the man, a teacher at the school. Mr. Burke or something like that. Nothing's the matter. Pete wiped the sweat from his forehead and blood from his cheek. Nothing. Nothing except for a chain of freak accidents that involved losing an eye or an arm. Nothing except for a robotic fox that wanted him to become a pirate or dead, whichever came first. Chuck had to be right. 
he had to get back to face Foxy to finish this one and for all. Mr. Burke reached out a hand. You don't look too good. You're bleeding from the eye. Let's go to the nurse to get it checked out. Pete pulled away. No, I'm fine, he insisted. All right, take it easy. What happened to your cheek? Too much has happened to me. Pete just shook his head. Too much. How can you begin to explain? I just want to help, Mr. Burke said. What's your name? No, you can't help me. No one can. He's after me and he's never going to stop. I believe him now. I thought I could fix it all by apologising. Pete laughed bitterly. <laughs> yeah, funny, huh? Like, sorry ever fixes anything. But I had to try, right? Who's after you, kid? What's his name? We can sit down with the principal, get this all sorted out. You just have to calm down, take a deep breath. You don't understand. There's no sitting down or talking. He's a freaking robot. Mr. Burke's eyes widened. A robot? Help me to understand. I sit down a moment. You can talk to me, okay? Sometimes we think things are way worse than they actually are. But once we stop and look at the whole picture, it's not that bad at all. Believe me, kid. Happens all the time. No. It's bad. Really bad. But I know what I have to do now. It'll all be over soon. I have to go back to the point of origin, where it all began. I have to face the villain. Before the teacher could stop him, Pete slipped away. Oh, we must be near the end now. He booked it down the school hallway, drenched in sweat. A hall monitor yelled for him, but Pete ignored what he was saying. He had to get out, had to end this. When he shoved open the doors, looking back over his shoulder, the hall monitor was talking into his radio. Pete missed a step and fell, stumbling down the school's front steps. His knees and palms were scraped and his body felt bruised, but he pushed himself to his feet to keep running. As he raced across the school's lawn, he dug out his phone and clicked on Chuck's number. It went straight to voicemail because Chuck was still in class. Chuck! Pete heaved into the phone, short of breath. You were right! It's been foxy all along. I have to go back to face him. Freaky stuff is still happening. But no way is Foxy going to win, Chuck. No freaking way. I'm sorry I didn't believe you, little bro. Meet me there as soon as you can. We can finish this together. In a blind panic, Pete rushed off the sidewalk and into the street. He sent something speeding towards him, and he turned. That's when a truck smashed into him with extreme force. His body went flying, his limbs twisting, and one moment felt like forever. Then he crashed, his body slamming the hard ground. He felt a crack, then a shatter. The force scalded his skin against the road as he rolled and rolled, leaving a path of blood behind him. Pain was everywhere, then everything went dark. Chuck, you were right. It's been Foxy all along. I have to go back to face him. Freaky stuff is still happening, but no way is Foxy going to win, Chuck. No freaking way. I'm sorry I didn't believe you, little bro. Meet me there as soon as you can. We can finish this together. Chuck clicked off his phone, looking over his shoulder, and nimbly hoped, uh, sorry, hopped his middle school's fence. Then he ran. He had to get to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. He had to help Pete. He pumped his arms hard uh, and fast to get out of the side of the school. When he felt safely out of view, he pulled out his inhaler, took two puffs, and walked till he could catch his, until he caught his breath. He still had a few miles to go. He wished he had his bike, but he didn't, and he wouldn't let Pete down. He wouldn't let him face Foxy alone. He started to run again, but that didn't last long. He wasn't much of an athlete. Chuck would run, but it was usually short distances. He always did poorly in the timed mile in gym classes. He glanced around and stiffened up when he saw a police car. Oh no! He ducked into a donut shop and waited for the cruiser to drive by. He wasn't used to breaking the rules and ditching school. This was the first time he'd done anything like this. What would happen if Mum found out? Would she ground him? Pete would probably laugh at him for being so scared. But that was okay. Pete could laugh at him all he wanted once this was all over. <clears throat> he was out of breath when he got to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza and his shirt was stuck to his back with sweat. He pushed through the front doors and felt relief when the cool conditioned air hit his face. Little kids were running around as he made his way to the corridor that led to the maintenance room. There was some sort of manager standing in front of the walkway. Dang it. Chuck bounced on his feet, waiting for the guy to walk away. He pretended to play an arcade game until the guy finally moved along. Chuck walked slowly to the doorway, slipped through, and raced through 
down down the corridor until he got to the door. It swung open to reveal absolute darkness. Chuck swallowed hard as he stepped inside, and the door slammed behind him. Fear nearly swallowed him whole, but he grabbed his phone from his pocket to turn on a light. Hiccup. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. All this talking. Uh, he smacked a hand to his mouth to try and stop the dumb hiccups. He flashed the phone light to the left and the right. No freaky ghosts, no robots. He took out his inhaler and took a quick puff as he continued to look around. Still the same dusty tables with old supply boxes and broken chairs like the first time they had visited. For some reason, that felt like weeks ago. Pete, he whispered. Where are you? <laughs> when there was no answer, he wondered if Pete was trying to scare him again. Then he pushed that thought away. Pete had sounded really upset on the voicemail. He'd been physically hurt, and he finally believed Chuck's theory that it all began with Foxy. They were finally agreeing on something. Now Pete was treating him like a real brother instead of a problem he had to deal with every day. Pete, are you here? When he was answered with silence, Chuck dialed his brother's number. It rang and rang, finally going to voicemail. Pete, where are you? Hiccup. <laughs> I'm here with Foxy waiting for you. Call me. Or just hurry up and get here. You know this place gives me the creeps. Hiccup. Hiccup. Chuck ended the call and stepped forward, aiming the phone light as the small stage. A chill ran through him and he shivered. I've got chills right now. I, I really want to know what's going to happen. Instinct told him to move far, far away from the stage to get out. He couldn't though. This wasn't about his fears. This was about his brother. Swallowing hard, he walked over to the control box. He would find out what happened to Pete that day. He really needed to know if Foxy was somehow haunting his brother. His hand was hovering over the start button when his phone rang and he jumped in the air. Hiccup, hiccup, hiccup. He quickly answered. Pete? No, son. It's Dad. Oh my god, what? Where are you? I went to school to get you, but you weren't there. Chuck was suddenly scared he would get in trouble for ditching. Oh, sorry. He's on the phone. <laughs> I th For a minute, I thought, like, Dad was, like, the person behind this entire thing. Uh, but then I realised it was the dad on the phone. Okay, anyway. Um... Um, I'm sorry, Dad. Hiccup. Pete needed me. I had to leave. Hiccup. I won't ever do it again, I promise. Pete? What do you mean? Did you talk to him? Um, not exactly. He left me a message to meet him, but he's not here yet. I don't know where he is. He won't answer his phone. Hiccup. Oh, son. His voice broke. What? What is it, Dad? A wave of dread washed over him. Why were you picking me up at school? Hiccup. Chuck. There's been an accident. Oh no! Okay. I don't want to flick over to the next page because I know it's the last page. It must be the last page. I have got literally... I've got so many... I've got goosebumps. <laughs> What's it going to be, right? Three, two, one. Oh my god, it's not even the last page. Dad picked up Chuck at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza and drove faster than normal... Wait, sorry. And drove faster than normal to Pete's high school. He didn't ask any questions about why Chuck was supposed to meet Pete there. He said Mum had gone straight to the school when she got the call that Pete had been hit by a truck. Ah, uh, okay. Let's keep the ditching school from your mum for the moment, Dad said. She doesn't need any more on her plate right now. Chuck felt the guilt like a punch in the gut. Okay, Dad. You have to understand. It was for Pete. I would never do it otherwise. I know, son. Don't worry too much about it. Brothers look out for each other. Chuck nodded. As they drove closer to the high school, Chuck spotted flashing lights. Police cars were blocking the street, and barricades were holding kids far away from the sidewalk. Chuck swallowed hard. Pete's going to be okay. Right, Dad? Dad pulled to the side of the road, a block away from the emergency. Oh! I'm really dumb. <laughs> I'm really dumb. The incident was when Pete got hit by the truck. I see. Okay. Um, and shut off the engine. He's going to be fine. But his voice sounded funny, like his throat was tight. His eyes looked scared and uncertain, as if he didn't believe his own words. Chuck rushed out of the car with his dad. They headed toward the flashing lights. A police officer held up his arms. Sorry, can't let you through. That's my son. I need to see him. My name is here. M my name is here. My wife is here. Name? 
Dinglewood. My son's name is Pete Dinglewood. He's the one who was hit. The policeman nodded and let them in. They passed more emergency workers than Chuck could count, and a truck that was pulled to the side with a huge dent in the front of the bumper. Chuck gasped and hoped that dent didn't come from hitting Pete. There was a man sitting on the curb talking to a police officer. He had his hat in his hands and he was crying. Chuck glanced towards the middle of the street and froze when he saw Pete's shoe lying there. It was a plain white sneaker, making the blood splattered on it horribly noticeable. All he could think was that Pete needed his shoe. Little black numbers on plastic folded cars were scattered uh, around the road like for an investigation. Chuck swallowed hard and followed his dad until they finally spotted his mum standing by a gurney. Uh, I don't know what that is. Her back was to them and her shoulders were shaking. There's mum, Chuck said, even though he was pretty sure dad had already seen her. Dad rushed to her side and put his arm around her. Chuck held back, afraid to see Pete on the gurney. He pulled out his inhaler and took a puff before he got any closer. Behind the barricades, there were some other high school students. Some faces were in shock, some kids were crying, and some kids were in pirate costumes. Pete probably loved that. The thought made Chuck's lips twitch, but he couldn't bring himself to smile. Chuck, Dad said, reaching out his hand. Come here, son. He was crying. He had never seen his dad cry before. Chuck didn't want to move, didn't want to walk to the gurney. If he could have, he would have gone in the opposite direction, but he forced a step forward, and then another. Wait, I'm, wait, hang on, didn't want to, Chuck didn't want to move. If he could have, he would have gone in the opposite direction, but he forced a step to forward and then another, sorry. He felt dazed and in slow motion, as if he were walking through heavy syrup. When he finally reached his dad and mum, he moved between them for support. Pete was laying on the gurney. His eyes were closed and he looked incredibly pale. The scratches from the fishing incident stood out like an angry red line on his face and he had fresh scrapes etched into his forehead. Chuck waited for his eyes to open, waited for him to move, blink, anything. He's gone Chuck, Dad said through tears. His words made Mum cry even harder. A man in a white uniform shirt walked over to them. I'm sorry for your loss. We can meet you at the hospital where you are ready. Dad said, yes, thank you. Dad said, oh, no, nope, I've already read that line. The man was wearing blue gloves. He grabbed the large zipper at Pete's chest and pulled it up, sealing Pete into a large canvas bag. Just like that, Pete was gone. Ah, that's... Wait. Wait, uh, what? Oh, okay, I thought that was the end. <laughs> I was about to say, I was literally just about to say, that is probably one of the worst endings in all the books. Because it was like this massive lead up with Foxy and stuff, and then it's just the ending here. No, this isn't the ending yet. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good. I was about to end it there. <laughs> Pete felt frozen like he couldn't move any part of his body. Strangely, he didn't feel cold or hot in any pain. Or any pain. He was surrounded by darkness. There were distant voices, sounds of movement. Hello? Where am I? He wondered. Weirdly, he couldn't move his lips. What the heck? It seemed like a long time passed. Finally, he heard something like a zipping sound. Then a bright light appeared around him. There was a man above him wearing clear goggles, a blue co cloth cap and a face mask covering his nose and mouth. Was he a doctor? Hey dude, you gotta help me, I feel weird. Pete figured he must be at the hospital. He'd been hurt by the truck. He remembered. He was trying to get to the pizza place, but he'd forgotten the rule his mum had ingrained in him since he was little, to look both ways before crossing the freaking street. Well, now he'd be fixed with some surgery. Relief flooded over him. He'd get fixed up and then he and Chuck would face Foxy together, and then it would be all over, finally. Another man appeared above Pete, looking down with sad eyes. Poor kid, so young, he said. Yeah, hate it when they're young like this. Really a shame, gives me the chill sometimes. Because of your own kids, right? Yeah, I'll be sure to give them an extra hug when I see them. Me too. The two men lifted up Pete's body, 
and set him on a hard table. Hey guys, for some reason I can't move. What's the matter with me? Did you give me something to numb me? This is kind of freaking me out and I've had a really bad week, you know, so please tell me everything is okay. A terrible thought dawned on Pete. Oh no, did the truck hurt my legs? Will I be able to walk again? Is that why I can't feel them? Why won't you talk to me, guys? I need answers. I need help. One man put his gloved fingers above Pete's eyes. Weird. What? I can't close his eyelids. It's like they're frozen open. It's happened before. Yeah, but I don't like it. I want them closed. The other man laughed. Suck it up, buttercup. We have work to do. He picked up a handheld screen. One good thing says here, the kid's an organ donor. Wait, what? Yeah, parts of him are going to be lucky recipients. He's young, his organs are healthy, we've we got to work fast though. No, there's a mistake, I'm okay, I'm not ready to give up my organs. Mum, Dad, where are you? Don't let them do this to me. The men grabbed large scissors and started to cut his clothes away. A few minutes later, music filled the room. Wait a minute, is this another nightmare? Am I dreaming? Please let me be this bad. Please let this be a bad dream. Let this not be real. Wake up now, Pete. Wake, wake up. Wake the hell up. <laughs> Sorry, I've been talking for like two hours. <laughs> well, not two hours. But yeah, close enough. Oh, okay. We're almost there. You got plans tonight? Yeah, taking the kids to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. They love that place. My kids love that place too. To those animatronics. Those animatronic things kind of freak me out, but the kids love them. Whatever makes them happy. Stop! I'm alive! You can't see my organs before I'm dead! Someone help me, please! The first man grabbed a scalpel and placed its point into Pete's chest. Oh, hold up a minute, the other man said, reading up again from the screen. What's up? Oh, thank goodness. Tell them. Tell them this is all a mistake. Tell him I'm still alive. Tell him not to cut me open. We have an urgent case in need of the eyes in one hand. It says here the kid is an exact match, but... The hand doesn't have much damage. It'll work, but we've got to put everything on ice quickly. The uh, the transport will be here before we know it. Let's do that first. No! The man with the scalpel looked down at Pete. Good job, kid. You're going to help a lot of people. He retrieved small forceps with his other hand. The second man turned on a saw small buzzsaw, the blade spinning into a circular blur. Let's get to work. Pete began to hear Foxy's music play in his head. You can be a pirate, but first you'll have to lose an eye and an arm, yar. Pete watched in helpless horror as the first man leaned down to take his eyes. Four weeks later, Chuck rode his bike to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. The clouds were heavy and dark, and there was a cold bite in the air. When he'd come home from school, no one was there. Even though Chuck knew the house was empty, he called out, Hello? Pete? The refrigerator answered back with a low hum. The house wasn't very big but it seemed huge and empty to Chuck. He used to want to be old enough to stay home by himself. Now that he'd gotten his wish, he wished for, hum for, for, he wished for company. Mum had finally been able to go back to work after weeks of crying. Dad was also at work. Somehow the grief of losing Pete had reunited his parents, and Dad had moved back home after the funeral. One day, Chuck watched them both clean up Pete's room. They picked up the dirty clothes threw away some garbage, made his bed, and closed the door. It hadn't opened since. Chuck hadn't met up with his friends in a while. He was supposed to be home during, doing his homework, but something had been driving him to go back. Back to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Back to see Foxy. He'd never told anyone what he and Pete had really thought about Pete's freak accidents. How had they believed the trouble had started or why they ever planned to meet at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza to face Foxy once and for all? For weeks, Chuck had felt this heaviness on his chest like he was supposed to do something that he never got to do, like he had a puzzle that was incomplete. He'd replayed Pete's last message over and over since the funeral. Chuck, you were right. It's been Foxy all along. I have to go back to face him. Freaky stuff is still happening, but no way is Foxy going to win. Chuck, no freaking way. I'm sorry I didn't believe you, bro. Meet me there as soon as you can. We can finish there together. <coughs> Pete's death nagged at Chuck day and night. Sometimes when he was sitting in class, the bell would ring and he'd realise the period was over before he'd noticed it had started. He was falling behind in every subject. Teachers stared at him, but no one said much. They all knew he'd lost his brother. They all knew he'd changed. Chuck sat alone at lunch, writing in his notebook, 
filling it with notes, ideas and scenarios on what could have happened to Pete and how they could have stopped it all before Pete had gone. Well, no more what ifs. Chuck was done wandering. He locked his bike on the bike rack in front of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. When he stepped through the doors, the familiar scent of pepperoni wafted over him. The pings and musical game sounds vibrated around him. He walked through the arcade and saw a group of kids huddled around a game. That used to be him. He'd always loved this place, until that fateful day, when Pete dragged him down the corridor to the maintenance room. Ah! <laughs> Sorry, I was just testing my audio. Uh, when Pete dragged him down to the corridor to the maintenance room, and everything had changed. He walked through the play area and over to the birthday tables and watched a couple of families sitting right in front of the stage. Everyone looked so happy. The little kids were eating pizza, enthralled by the show of the animatronics. Some were singing with their mouths full. <clears throat> the kids clapped and cheered after the song finished. Chuck walked toward the corridor that led to the maintenance room. He looked over his shoulder to see if anyone was watching, then he slipped through. He walked slowly down the darkened hallway, past the old posters, until he reached the door. He reached out for the handle, and his hand shook. He took a breath and pulled the heavy door open, stepping into darkness. The door slammed at his back, the sound echoing in his ears. He pulled out his inhaler as his breath thinned and took a puff. Then he shoved his inhaler into his pocket and pulled out his phone light. He went straight to the small stage and straight to the open control box, no more wasting time. A shiver crawled down his back, but he ignored it. If he hesitated, he knew he wouldn't do it and he'd be replaying the moment over and over in his head. He had to do it. He had to find out what happened to Pete. This is for you, Pete, he said into the dark room. I'll face the villain and beat the game. He braced himself and slammed down on the start button. He waited for the curtain to pull back, for Foxy to begin to sing. But nothing happened. All Chuck heard was complete silence. Um... <laughs> Okay, okay, Boomer. I've, I'm shivering again. Wow. Okay, that was an interesting story. I don't know. I don't really know what it could tell us about the law. Um, obviously, they they are brothers, so it, it's a parallel to FNAF Four Brothers, of course. Um, I mean, there is that nightmare, of course, where Foxy. Uh, appeared. I don't know if that can tell us anything about FNAF 4 gameplay. I don't really know. I don't know what this story implies to us. But it's all about Foxy. Could Foxy be the Bite of 87 victim? I don't know. Um, not victim, sorry. Bite of 87, uh. You know what I mean. I don't know what Scott is trying to imply with this story. But it's interesting, and it's got a weird ending. I, I'm not too sure. I am not too sure. When Pete was like awake, but people couldn't hear him, or and he couldn't move and stuff. I think that's showing like. I don't know. I think that's showing that his remnant is like. It's really hard. I don't know. I have actually no idea. Anyway, I think you guys should tell me your theories on this story, because it's, it's strange. It's a strange one indeed. Um, did I like it? Yeah, I, it was quite enjoyable. But um, I'm just very confused, really, uh, on how this helps us with the lore of Five Nights at Freddy's. But that's what you guys are going to tell me in the comments up below, I'm sure. So uh, thank you so much for, for watching or listening. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'll see you when we read the next story, which is Dance With Me, which is the one I'm most excited about in, in this book. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching, and goodbye!